So in life, I have been told time and time again, dude, you're so nice. Nice. Hey, Alex, you're nice. 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 Hey, man, you're a nice guy. Well, today Jordan Peterson's gonna tell us why nice guys finish last. They often don't even know what they want. So we're gonna be checking out this video, and I'm gonna see how many of these principles apply to me. And we're gonna see if we can change my life and make me an asshole. Although some people would already say that's true. Let's not go down that road. I have gone down the rabbit hole of Jordan Peterson and it has been fantastic thus far. That being said, he is a polarizing character. It spurs a lot of controversy, which means I get a lot of hate comments from some of you sons of bitches. Fuck you, Alex. So much so that I'm gonna have to damn change my name, flee the country, and live off the grid for a while. That's nice. And if I were gonna do that, then the first thing I would do is get a new VPN. Y'all know anything about VPNs? No? Well, good, I'll tell you. Shameless, seamless plug time. Guys, the sponsor of today's video is Atlas VPN. Now, if you're like me and you have found your ever in your life aimlessly scrolling through Netflix without knowing what to watch, I got you. Say for example, you are a delinquent, like myself, and you want to watch The Human Centipede 3. Oh! Ew! Dude! What the fuck? But it is only available on Bulgarian Netflix. Well, simple. All you have to do is connect to Bulgaria through Atlas VPN. They'll encrypt your data and give you a brand new IP address. So Netflix actually thinks that you are connecting from Bulgaria. And you can watch your deviant things on the television. You've all heard of VPNs by now because it is extremely smart to use one. It makes checking things out on the internet safer and more secure. And it doesn't trace back to you, so watch what you want. <laughs> you sick bastard. And get this, Atlas VPN's data breach monitor, scans the internet to see if anybody has done some sketchy stuff like trying to steal your passwords to hack into your accounts. Atlas VPN works on literally any device. And by clicking the link at the top of the description, you can get a huge discount on a three-year deal for only $1.99 a month. I know. And if for some reason you don't click the link below, then that's okay. You're just a naive fool that doesn't know what's good for him, and I don't respect you at all. <laughs> all right, guys, let's get back to the reaction. Should hire me as a voice actor. If you ask a disagreeable person what, what he wants, say, or she wants, they'll tell you right away. They, they know. It's like, this is what I want, and this is how I'm going to get it. But agreeable people, especially if they're really agreeable, are so agreeable that they often don't even know what they want. Because uh, they're Jesus. so... So he's already speaking truth about my life, honestly, dude. Yeah, I tend to be that agreeable person where they're like, what do you want? I'm like, I don't even really know. I can just go with the flow. That tends to be like my, my response. Oh, God. And to finding out what other people want and to trying to make them comfortable and so forth, that it's harder for them to find a sense of their own desires as they move through life. And that's mm. not, look, there's situations where that's advantageous, but it's certainly not advantageous if you're going to try to uh, forge yourself a career. That just doesn't work at all. And so, even though on average men and women aren't that much different in terms of their levels of agreeableness by the group, if you go out and you look at the extremes, they're very different. So all of the most agreeable people are women, and all of the most disagreeable people are men. And the thing is, the extremes are often what matter, rather than what's in the middle. And so one of the ways that's reflected in, in society, by the way, is there's way more men in prison. And the mm. best personality predictor of being imprisoned is to be low in agreeableness. Disagreeableness. It makes you wow. tell us. Now you may think, well, what's the opposite of compassion and politeness? And the answer to that is, I think it's best sort of conceptualized as a as a trading game. So let's say that we're going to play repeated trading games. And if you're very agreeable, then you're going to bargain harder on my behalf than you're going to bargain on your own behalf. Whereas if you're very mm. disagreeable, you're going to do the reverse. You're going to think, I'm in this trading game for me, and you're going right. to take care of your own interests. Where an agreeable person is going to say, no, no, at best, this is, at, at worst, this has to be 50-50, but I'd like to help you every way I can. One of the things you have to be careful of if you're agreeable is not to be exploited because you'll line okay. up to be exploited. And I think the reason for that is because you're wired to be exploited by infants. And so that just doesn't Whoa, work so well. In that wired to be exploited by infants. Whoa. Okay. Well, I can't say no to my infant nieces. Ah, okay. Actual world. And one of the things, one of the things that happens very often in psychotherapy, you know, people come to psychotherapy for multiple reasons, but one of them is they often come because they're too agreeable. And so what they get is so-called assertiveness training, although it's not exactly mm. assertiveness that's being trained. 
what it is is the ability to learn how to negotiate on your own behalf. And one of the things I tell agreeable people, especially if they're conscientious, is say what you think. Tell the truth about what you think. There's going to be things you think that you think are nasty and harsh. And they probably are nasty and harsh. But they're also probably true. But you got to say them anyway. You need to bring yeah. those up to the forefront and deliver the message. And it's not straightforward at all because agreeable people do not like conflict. Not at mm. all. They smooth the water. You know, and you can see, yeah. you can see why that is in accordance with the hypothesis that I've been putting forward. I've always been the type of person also that kind of can put the flames out, right? If two people are having an argument, I can be that, that force that kind of levels everything and kind of brings it back to something good and positive. It's maybe saying like a, a tasteful joke, which is kind of weird in that moment. Dude, this is exactly me. I'm not kidding. You don't want fights to break out. You don't want anything to disturb the, the relative peace. Right. You know, and if you're also more prone to being hurt physically and perhaps emotionally. Sorry, real quick. And that, pro that probably, that piece probably stems from a childhood of trauma. My parents were always fighting. There were always problems. There was always shit going on. And I, I never wanted that in my life. So if I was in charge, I wanted to be that smoothing force, that easy, agreeable force. Because it's just something that I never saw growing up. You also may be loath to engage in the kind of high intensity conflict that will solve problems in the short term. Because a lot of conflict, mm. it takes a lot of conflict to solve problems in the short term. And, you know, if that can spiral up to where it's dangerous, which it can, if it gets uncontrolled, it might be safer in the short term to keep the waters smooth and to not delve into those situations where conflict emerges. The problem with that is it's not a very good medium to long-term strategy. Okay. Because right? lots, lots of times there are things you have to talk about because they're not going to go away. And the advantage to having a well-socialized, disagreeable person is that they really don't let much get in their way. A well-socialized, so disagreeable person. That's the goal, right? Socialized, that person can be quite, quite the creature, you know, because they're very, they're very forward-moving in their nature and very difficult to stop. But if you don't get them successfully domesticated, tamed, roughly speaking, by the time they're four, their peers reject them. And that's a big problem because your job as a parent is to make your child socially desirable by the age of four. Whoa. You, gotta, you, you, you want to <laughs> turn that into your brain. Socially you desirable by the age of four, That's wow. That's your job. And here's, here's why. You, you think it's, it's easy if you think about it carefully. So you imagine you've got a, you've got a three-year-old child, so right. sort of halfway through that initial period of socialization, and you take that child out in public. Okay, what do you want for the child? Who cares about you? What do you want from the for the child? You want the child to be able to interact with other children mm -hmm. and adults yeah. so that the children are welcoming and smile and want to play with him or her. And so the adults are happy to see the child and treat him or her properly. And if your child's a horrible little monster because you're afraid of disciplining them or you don't know how to do that properly, Jesus. then what they're going to do is the they're going to experience nothing but rejection from other children right. and false smiles from other parents and adults. Mm. And that's, so then you're throwing the child out there into a world where every single face that they see is either hostile or lying. And that's not something oh, that's going to be particularly shit. conducive to the mental health or the well-being of your child. If your child can learn a couple simple rules of behavior, like don't interrupt adults when they're talking too much and pay attention and try not to hit the other kids over the head with the truck any more than is absolutely <laughs> necessary, then, and, you know, and share and play properly, then when they meet other kids, the, the kids are going to try out a few little play routines on them and that's going to go well and then they're going to go off and socialize each other for the rest of their lives. Because Ugh, my man's already got me wanting to raise my kids differently and I don't even have kids. Makes me want to bring kids in the world just to have them be good individuals. I don't even have kids! From four years old onwards, the primary socialization with children takes place among other children. And so if the kids don't get in on that early, they don't move into that developmental spiral upwards and they're left behind. And you can mm. imagine how terrible that is because a four-year-old will not play with another four-year-old who's two. But a five-year-old certainly will not play with a five-year-old who's two, right? Because the gap is just starting to get unbelievably large. And so the kids start out behind and then the peers leave them behind and then those kids are alienated and outside the peer group for the rest of their life. Well, those are the ones that grow up to be long-term antisocial. Right? They're already aggressive. Mm. It doesn't dip down. Now, what happens to normal boys, roughly speaking? Imagine the aggressive two-year-old types. They get socialized, so right. their level of aggression goes down. Yep. 
and then they hit puberty and right. testosterone kicks in and bang, levels of aggression go back up. And so that's why males are criminals between the ages roughly of 16 and about 25. So, and it matches the creativity curve, uh, by the way. It's so cool. Peaked. If you look at the spike of creativity among men, 16 to 25, and it starts to go down, criminality matches that absolutely perfectly. Wow. That's pretty cool. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that there is that overlap between creativity and that incarceration rate? So interesting. So, the testosterone levels raise the average level of aggression among men. It's more dominance than aggression, actually, and testosterone is by no means all bad. And then it starts to decrease at about age 25 or 26, which is usually when men stop staying up late at night, stop drinking as much, develop a full-time career, and take on the burdens and responsibilities and opportunities that are associated with a long-term mm -hmm. partner and family. Yeah. So, yep. also that's, that's the I've development been, yeah, of, yeah, that's true. of, of what, I, what I would call predatory aggression. Because I also think that the, the agreeableness distribution is probably something like predatory Dude, aggression. One thing about Jordan Peterson is his ability to capture people's attention with lecture. In school, I missed my fair share of classes, skipped my fair share of classes. I never really got anything substantive out of the professors I felt like. <laughs> So I was like, I'm wasting my damn time. I could be off doing a YouTube channel, making music happen, doing whatever the hell I wanted. If I had a professor like Jordan Peterson, dude, I'd be going to every damn class. I'm so captive in what he's saying. It's so Versus insane. maternal sympathy. It's something like that. So if you look at other, if you look at other mammals mm. that, are, that are predators, because we're predators as well as prey animals, if you look at other animals like bears, the male bear has absolutely nothing to do with the raising of the infants. In fact, the female bears will keep the male the hell away because he's likely to kill the infants, and maybe even to eat them. So there's no oh. ma maternality at all in oh. solitary male God. mammalian predators. It's really useful to investigate the viewpoints of people who have opposing views to yours. Because they'll tell you things, yeah. not only will they tell you things you don't know, they'll also tell you how to see the world in ways that you don't see it. And they'll also have skills mm. that you don't have, that you could develop. So, for example, if you're an introverted person, it's very useful to watch an extroverted person because the extroverted person has ways of being in the social world that aren't natural to you, that you can use as to improve right, your toolkit. Right. And if you're disagreeable, one of the best things Learn to do with disagreeable people, especially if that's alienating them from other people, for example, because it can, you know, people treat you like you're a selfish, arrogant son of a... Maybe that's because you are. <laughs> it's like, okay, so what do you do about that? Yeah. One, of the, one of the most uh, promising treatments, let's say, for that, is get the person to do something for someone else once a day, just as a practice, and learn how to do it. Maybe you can wake the circuit up, you know, if you think that it's lying dormant in you, which is probably right. You know, I think we have a very wide range of propensities within us. Some are switched on, genetic propensities. Some are switched on, but I think that if you put yourself in the right situation or walk yourself through the right exercises, you can switch some of these other things on as well. Mm. But it takes work and, and, and dedication yeah. and discipline. I would say, generally speaking, if you want to adapt yourself properly to life, you should find a niche in the environment that corresponds with your temperament. Right? You shouldn't work... Find a niche in the environment that corresponds with your temperament. Okay? Because it's just too damn difficult. But having done that, then you should work on developing the, the skills and, and viewpoints that exist in the space opposite to your personality. Because that's where you're fundamentally underdeveloped. And that way I think you can extend out your temperamental capability across a wider range. And to me that's roughly equivalent as bringing a richer toolkit to each situation. He's so good. You know, so if you're hyper extroverted, you so probably good. learn to shut up at parties now and then. And listen, just to see what's mm. going on. To see if you can manage it. Yeah. Know? And if you're introverted, well, then you should learn how to speak in public and to, and to learn how to go to parties without hiding in the corner and saying nothing to anyone. You know, and if you're agreeable, That's then totally you need to learn how to be dis- I'm at a party, I'm definitely in the corner hiding away if I'm there, or I'm petting the dog, or I am eating all the snacks. It's where I am. But the, the truth of the matter is, I wouldn't be at the party, I would be at home making videos for you guys to consume. Oh, hey guys, just skipping another party making videos. <laughs> disagreeable so people can't push you around. And if you're disagreeable, you, yeah. learn, you need to learn how to be agreeable so that you're not an evil son of a bitch. So, and the same thing applies even in the conscientious domain. It's like if you're too conscientious, you need to learn to 
relax and let go a little bit. Yeah. And if you're unconscientious, yeah. it's time like, get out the Google Calendar, man, and start scheduling your day, right? And beat yourself on the back of the head with a stick until you're disciplined enough so that you can actually stick to something for some length of time and not living in absolute squalor, which is something that would characterize someone who's very disorderly, for example, because they just they wow. don't notice. Essentially, implement them. tactics Disorder. and traits into your life that Maybe you don't naturally see it, embody. But it That's have kind of what I'm getting Emotional from it. valence, and so it doesn't have any motivational significance. You know, so the other thing you might want to think about too, if you're choosing a partner, is try not to choose someone who's too distant from you on the temperamental variables, mm -hmm. because you're going to have a hard time bridging the gap. You know, it's hard yeah. for an introverted person and an Sarah extroverted is person very to coexist. Sarah and I are very similar in that regard. Like, very, very similar. We're both pretty agreeable. Disorderly person and a disorderly person to coexist because they will drive each other nuts. Why don't you pick up? Why are you so obsessed by it? <laughs> Get off my back! So that you can yes. negotiate the space with your partner. It's a fucking as well. Pringles can! I don't can. think you should try someone who's exactly the same as you. Anyway. Because then you don't have the benefits of the alternative viewpoint. But you've got to watch right, it because you may right. hit irreconcilable differences of various sorts. And I've seen that most particularly among couples who are high and low in openness. That's a rough one. And also high and low in conscientiousness. That's another rough one because they just cannot see how the other person sees the world at all. Sarah and I are both very similar in terms of conscientiousness, in terms of agreeableness. So I think that the thing that stands out about our relationship is, is that alternative perspective, there's alternative traits, that's let's learn something that's not so natural to us. That's something that we're both gonna have to come out of our comfort zones and work on to be completely honest and upfront. Oh, and that was it? Okay, cool. Now, this is where a lot of people will get stuff that Jordan Peterson says wrong. I watched a Jordan Peterson video and he just said to not be nice to people. So you're a piece of shit and you dress like a fucking homeless man and you smell like garden cheese. No, he's not saying that. You can be nice, you can be kind, you can be agreeable. There's nothing wrong with being nice. He's just saying don't be a pushover. Don't let people take advantage of you. Don't let people exploit you. The one quote of that that hit me the hardest, dude, is agreeable people, especially if they're really agreeable, are so agreeable that they often don't even know what they want. Like that just slaps home, dude. <laughs> Lessons like this, man, it, they are the lessons that I needed to know growing up that I never got. My dad did not do the greatest job of raising me because um, he was absent for the vast majority of my life. Uh, so these are things that I haven't heard that I wish I did hear. And it's cool because I get to, you know, learn stuff like this, understand people from a more psychological perspective, and then kind of implement that and, and use that in my everyday life. And I've seen changes already just from small things that I've implemented in my life from Jordan Peterson. So if you're watching this video up to this point, you love Jordan Peterson. You love these videos. Maybe you're new to the channel. Hit that subscribe button. Join the Hefnerd family. If you are like me and you are agreeable, I mean, shit, let's try to just implement a little bit of disagreeableness into our, uh, into our day. You agree? <laughs> Trick question. Because if you agree, you're agreeable. And if you disagree, then you're not getting the disagreeableness. You see what I did? It sets you up for failure. <laughs> what do you say about that, Jordan Petey? Absolute squalor. That being said, I will see you guys tomorrow. That's a motherfucking fact. Oh, yeah, I love y'all more than anything. And don't you forget it. Elon, keep smoking. Peace. Don't